We're at the Musée d'Orsay, and we're looking at a cast from 1917, the year that Rodin died of his The Gates of Hell, which is this huge project that the artist worked on for the last decades of his life that he never finished. And in fact, we're not even sure how it fits together because it was found in pieces in his studio. And so we're looking at a plaster cast to be specific. It's impossible to think about doors without thinking about Ghiberti's doors on the baptistry of the Cathedral of Florence, which were called the Gates of Paradise because they were so beautiful. So this is a modern answer to that, isn't it? Right, because of course those depict biblical scenes from the Old and New Testament, but here we're really unmoored from that tradition, from that iconography in many ways. It's a literary tradition, and it's referring back to Dante, but ever so loosely. So we have Dante at the top there. Right, he's in the tympana. You know, that's also a standalone sculpture which is called The Thinker. And is here Dante, in a sense, gazing into hell? I think we should actually say right up front that this was a commission, and this was intended to actually be for a building that was to be on the site of the Musée d'Orsay, which was to be a museum of decorative arts, which was never built. But this was a commission that Rodin got, and when he had finished the design of the doors, he was ready to cast it, but then the project itself fell through, so he kept working on it. And in a sense, the sculpture continued to evolve. You do see so many figures that you recognize as standalone sculptures by Rodin. But the thing that strikes me most is just how much the figures emerge from the background of the doors. And I said background sort of in quotes. And the doors should be in quotes. And the doors should be in quotes, Because they could never function anymore. But it's like the doors don't even look like solid forms. They're like vapor from which these forms emerge and spill out into our space. It's almost as if we imagine the surface of those doors to be the surface of the ocean and sort of waves coming forward and these figures sort of rising and then falling. Right. Um, And there's this sort of constant sense of motion and undulation. In a sense, form taking shape and then form receding into a sort of indistinctness. Almost like a sense of eternal becoming. So this sort of foment of the creative. But this dark notion, because the, the standalone figures that we're seeing are figures that are tragic. We have Paola and Francesca. We have Ugolino. The figures who Dante finds in hell, who Um, are being tortured and punished for their sins on earth. All the way at the top, instead of angels, we have three shades. These are figures that are actually a repeat. So it's one figure that's seen three times, almost sort of cinematographic in a sense, but creating a kind of unified form with, it's sort of a little bit difficult to see from below, but with, with shoulders that actually create a flat plateau and three arms that sort of pull downward and pull our eye down into the gates themselves. You know, I'm so reminded of Michelangelo when I look at all of these figures and the expressive power of the body, especially the male body, and also the way that some of the forms are fragmented reminds me of looking at ancient Greek and Roman sculpture. So this is a really modern reinvention of sculpture, yes, clearly informed by Michelangelo, clearly informed by the classical, but this notion of the fragment itself, this notion of reuse, this notion of reworking, very much a 19th century, very much a modern notion. And in a way, I think the forms, although derived from the narrative of Dante's Inferno, really come to take on a kind of more universal significance about the human condition, about suffering, about sin, about emotion and the power of the body. 